Welcome back to part two. The explanation of how a baffle shield eliminates and is an effective solution to prevent radio frequency in a tube amp or for any other amplifier or radio circuit for that matter. But our interest is in the tube amp. So whether you're using a tour board or a printed circuit board or any other circuit board for that matter, it's the preamp that needs shielding. You should notice when you open up any modern piece of electronics, let's say you have a two-way radio, the preamp, the signal coming in from the microphone to the preamp, that preamp section is typically enclosed in a metal box. It's shielded. That's how they take care of it nowadays. In the older Fenders and Marshalls and Boogie Masons, it, the, the, the board was completely open. Now then, because of the, the technology from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, which is where we get our tube amps, someone converted a radio into just the amplifier. They just used amplifier. The preamps are located on one side of the tube board, or the printed circuit board. The power uh, finals, or power tubes, and power transformers are on the other side. There's distance between the two. We'll discuss why that's also an effective solution, but nowadays, with more radio interference, we need a little bit more shielding in those amps. So, <clears throat> the problem gets down to capacitive or electric field coupling between the components. The components, as they laid out across the turret board, are so close and they're parallel to one another that one interferes with the next. They're not physically connected, but they are connected electromagnetically, and that is what's causing the problem, and that's what we have to solve. So that's the reason we I, I baffle shields an effective solution. And then when you're placing a cell phone on a tube amp or any other electronic device for that matter, sometimes you hear that alien sound. And I'm going to show you why that is a problem and what the results are. It's, it's a significant problem. You can hear it. And then why just shield the preamp? Why not the power section? I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. So in a book, if you go back to any book, uh, Radio Theory, Radio Handbook, uh, Olson's book on, uh, you know, radio work that he's did, there's always this one section, it's rather obscure. You know, you, you pick up a book, you read through 700 pages, and there's this one paragraph that they point out, and it was just common knowledge to them, so they didn't elaborate much on it, but they state three significant points that are lost on tube amp builders, or those are like me that also restore and repair. One, shielding. The grid and plate circuits should be separated in their screen to prevent capacitive coupling. You'll notice on a fender, when the resistors that go, the plate resistors that go from the circuit board to the, to the plate, they're generally offset in a Y pattern. One resistor, the other resistor, they're not parallel. They're offset. That helps the situation. They also build the preamp in a non-magnetic chassis. And they keep it uh, separate a, cons a considerable distance away from the power section. As I showed in another video previously, the transformer location and orientation is important. Generally, on a transformer, you have flux lines on, so wherever the steel is, where the coil is, is where your flux lines are. So the power transformer is orient where the flux lines are mostly in this plane. And then the output transformer has its transformer oriented 90 degrees and possibly upside down so that there's a very minimal overlap or intersection between the flux lines. If they overlap, it's a considerable noise uh, issue and then wherever it's being picked up as far as RF goes from one transfer is transformer is transferred over conducted to the other transformer so that's the reason they offset it. They also the, the original builders and designers of these circuits said separate them away. Distance is your friend. Well in modern electronics boxes getting smaller as they as they do we can get things crowded and compact there comes a problem 
of distance. We, we eliminate distance, now we pick up a problem again, so we need a shield. The use of mu metal. You can use mu metal to shield the microphone transformers or the output transformer. That would be an expensive deal. Or use humbucking coils. Humbucking, it was a technique that came out of the 1930s for the with the original speakers. It was then later employed on guitar pickups. That's where you have two coils wound in opposite directions and when you couple them together whatever noises in one is canceled out by the other. We don't have that luxury on the, the connecting the guitar up and preamps into an amp because if the humbucker is on the guitar you're not going to get it. So we still need shielding. So, turret board typically laid out like this. At the top, you'll see R2, C2, C1, R1. Those are your resistors, capacitors coming in from the signal in your microphone, your guitar, and they're in parallel. And on the side view, you can see them. Now, the capacitor, if this was the body of the capacitor, the disc capacitor, and the next one's next to it, what we're worried about is the distance and then the cross-sectional area of each because now one's aimed at the other. Back to Amper's Law. It's whatever current's going through the wire or through the coil is proportional to the, electronic, the electromagnetic field it generates. And because of that, when you look, bring a signal into, say, R1 in this example, it's not the signal's not just going through the resistor, the more current that's flowing through there, albeit very small, and that's the problem, it's very small, but it's a problem. The more current that goes through, the bigger the field. So R1's generating these flux lines, just like a transformer does. There's current going in a transformer into the coil. The stronger the current, the stronger the field, the elect electromagnetic field. And then all of them, it goes out and goes back into C1, which goes to C2, it goes to R2, which goes on and on and on. The stronger signal coming in, the stronger the flux lines, and all of a sudden, each of these four elements here are generating electromagnetic flux. And they all are intersecting with one another. It would be better if there was enough distance between R1 and C1 where they just, they don't intersect, but they do. In fact, in this example, what you see is R2 interferes with C2, C2 interferes with C1, and the interference and, and crossover between C1 and C2, its flux lines transferred over to R2. All of a sudden, it's the perfect storm. Everybody interferes with everybody else. And we want to ever have everyone play nicely. Just sit there, do your thing by yourself. But in a preamp, none of the, the because of the closeness on the circuit board, we don't have that luxury. We're going to need some shielding. So, to explain the math behind this, the capacitive coupling, the equation that you see on the screen, C equals 8.8 .8 times the cross sectional area, the, the area of the conductor. Now, the conduct area is the area of the capacitor resistor and the area of the wire coming out either side connecting to each of the lugs and if you want to get really technically correct we got to calculate the area of the lug. I've chosen not to do that in this example but you get the point. There's a lot of cross-sectional area one's aimed at the other. Now if we were to stagger the components we would minimize it would be a step in the right direction but that's not how the boards are built. They're in parallel. So and then the distance of the separation. It's not a lot in our print circuit board, they're even closer. So the area and the distance between the two give us stray capacitance. Now then, spurious current is in the next equation there. C is a stray capacitance, a change in voltage uh, between the, the two components, whether there's a resistor capacitor or two resistors or two capacitors, whatever there's uh, the, the change in voltage over time so it gets down to this as an example if you have one picofarad of stray capacitance from the equation at the top and you have a one volt pulse through that component and the rise time or the signals at thousand hertz what it results into is one microamp 
You go, one microamp, that's, that's not a big deal. I agree with you. It's not a big deal. But here's where the problem gets down to. Now then, we have our components on the board and we have a radio station coming in at a 100 megahertz. Putting 100 megahertz into the previous equation and we have a 6.3 picofarad capacitance that results in 0.6 milliamps that can be heard. Now you have the, you've reached the threshold of hearing. This may actually be, when you measure it, about uh, 35 to 40 dB down. You're beginning to hear some hiss. The hiss isn't anything to do with the resistor. It has everything to do with the stray capacitance. The capacitive coupling of the components. And it normally sounds like... Now then, the alien noises. Worse yet, you have one gigahertz coming in from your cell phones communicating with the cell tower. You put the cell phone on top of the amp and most of the time it's not a problem. Next time you put it somewhere else on the amp, you put it over the preamp side of the amp and you start hearing aliens. And that's annoying. Especially if you're at a gig and everyone's listening and having a good time and all of a sudden these aliens show up. What is that? Well, it's simply this. You put one gigahertz in on the equation, into the equation, at 6.3 picofarads, what you have now is it results in 6.3 milliamps. That's a lot of amperage going into the preamp. It's going to get amplified. What does preamp do? A preamp takes a few milliamps, not a lot, and it multiplies it up 60 to 100 fold, depending whether you have a single stage or a two stage or three stage preamp. It, that 6.3 milliamps from the aliens gets amplified and it overtakes the amp. You get to hear it with everybody else. We want to stop that. We can do that with a baffle shield, but that's why you hear the alien noise that it's not much of a signal, it won't fry your brain and you don't have to wear an aluminum hat with your cell phone, but on a preamp side of an amp, it you can hear, it, it does interfere and we shield it and it becomes less a problem. Now then, why doesn't this occur in the power section? Well, simply because, again, on the preamp we take a very few milliamps and we're, we increase the the signal strength from the preamp to the uh, power amp six almost 600 fold times even 100 fold times it's a problem but on a power section it takes an input signal is it's in a couple volts and you bump it up a couple volts it's actually going from maybe uh, say five milliamps and then the power say you're dealing with 6l6 and it's a b operation it may range from idle of 35 milliamps to maybe 60 or 80 milliamps depending on your design that's not a lot it's bumping it up a little but it's not bumping it near like a preamp section further with a push-pull design the reason they came up with the push-pull design is a spurious signal coming in on the a section also goes on the b section they are in it's a hum elimination circuit at that point they cancel out the the signal that you want from your guitar or microphone passes through but the spurious signal being small it just canceled out it's a noise canceling circuit so you won't hear it there but you don't have noise canceling circuits you don't have an a b circuit on the preamp now then on a single tube amp it's still not a problem because the spurious signal is down in milli just a few milliamps and the single state normally won't process that it's sort of immune but back to the first point in the, the previous slide keep the grid and screen power separated from one another and it minimizes that problem the problem with the hum and noise and rf that we typically see in a tube amp is generally related uh, relegated to 90% of the time into the preamp you take care of the preamp and shield it hum and noise will go away for you so returning back to the example we have installed the 
baffle shield. Now the first mistake would be if it doesn't eliminate it is because as you see in the ex example here, I put I put the baffle shield in. It's a copper structure. It's honey. It's a comb that goes over the components, and they're all separated. And any flux lines that hit the copper will go to ground. Now then, if you connect that ground to the ground of the signal wire coming in, say it's a coax, you're not star grounding. It's going to be effective, but if you're still hearing it, it's because the flux lines come out of the baffle shield. They, you connect it to the signal uh, shield wire, and it re-injects it through the shield into the signal wire and re-injects it in a circuit. While this is going to be very effective, is it may not be perfect. And if it's not perfect, then you need to go to a star ground. Take the ground from the baffle shield back to the star ground. The shield from the signal wire goes to star ground. We know then at the star ground, everything's at the same potential. There's no chance of the signal re-injecting itself from the baffle shield into the signal shield coming in to the amp. So that is the explanation. Well, you've covered capacitive coupling. That's the problem. If we can eliminate ca capacitive coupling, we can then eliminate the RF and the aliens that are coming into our circuits. We use a baffle shield for that, connect it to a star ground. And it's only the preamp we have to deal with. However, if you do have a problematic amp, if you can isolate where the noise is, where the RF is coming into a circuit, the baffle shield will be the, the tool of choice, the design of choice to eliminate that. So why doesn't a ferrite bead work? Because it doesn't solve if you, the problem with capacitive coupling. A lot of folks will put a ferrite bead on the input signal coming in, but that only, only if the RF is coming in on a signal cable will that be somewhat effective but you still have the signal going through the preamp. RF is coming in, radio station is coming in on that preamp, and the mu bead silences everything before, but it doesn't silence everything after, and that's the reason for the baffle shield. Thank you for watching. I hope you find this useful.